Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCG live codes, make sure you check out the Town store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code Omnipoke. For today's video, I'm going to be going over the top 10 decks in the Obsidian Flames format. It's a pretty small format until we get the introduction of 151, but there are a number of regional and special events happening within this format, so I did want to talk about how the Obsidian Flames set shakes up the metagame. So let's do our rundown of the top 10. In at number 10, we have Chen Pao Bax Calibur. It seems to be just a kind of inconsistent mess right now. It has a number of unfavorable matchups. These are sub 40% matchups. And in part, that's because this deck doesn't quite always get online, isn't on full cylinders. And there are ways that archetypes can take advantage of these inconsistencies with a number of Path to the Peak in some of the worst matchups like Giratina Lost Zone and Miraidon, which of course can also boast some weakness into the Palkia part of your deck if you're choosing to play it. But I kind of think the biggest concern for Chen Pao is that it doesn't have many favorables that it can boast. Yes, it's nice to pick up a decent matchup into the new kid on the block, the Charizard Pidgeot EX deck, and it's pretty solid into Lugia, which not many decks can boast. So Chen Pao Baxcalibur does have kind of a unique matchup spread, but it still feels like it hasn't been fully cracked, and it feels still like a combo-based variant, which still has to struggle in the opening turns. The list I've constructed is trying to be simplistic. I'm still a fan of the Palkia over the Arc V-Star line, just giving yourself an extra attacker and threatening the turn two Moonlight Shuriken a little bit more reliably, I would say. I'm also a fan of the Cross Switches still in the deck list, but I haven't got the Cancelling clone in here right now or Lost City. So it's trying to slowly get through a Mana Fee and try and still weave in Greninja at different points in the game. Maybe it opens up the window for the opponent to re-establish their Mana Fee, and we kind of have that back and forth until you're able to weave in your Greninja at times. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to make the list as consistent as possible and have the Barrel line in the deck list as well, so we aren't completely wrecked by Ionos. For other options, of course, there is that debate around which V-Star you could be playing, and if you are playing Star Buff, I think it becomes more reasonable to add in at least one copy of Lost City and at least one copy of Cancelling Cologne, because you can Star Buff to hit this combo more early in the game and the earlier the better really for this sort of combination of cards where you are dealing with Manaphy plus another low hit point Pokemon or cancelling out the Manaphy itself and just going for two other low hit point Pokemon. Some evolving basics uh, in particular can be massive getting rid of Charmanders and Pidgeys or getting rid of double Curlier or Rolts. These are all massive plays you can go for. So I think the arc leans into that high roll play a little bit more whereas I think the Palkia gives you a more stable play on turn two more often than not. So it's really up to your play style. In at number nine, we have the new Terrastal Charizard EX. This is going to be combined with the Pidgeot EX, also from Obsidian Flames and Arceus V-Star. I do believe that this is a combo-based deck, so having Starbirth for those turn two reaches towards your rare candy combos is just so integral to the archetype. And Charizard has a really interesting matchup spread, boasting a pretty good time into Mew V Max, Gardevoir, Miraidon, and Lugia. These are all some nice boasts to have here. Here. Naturally, your hit points is just so difficult to reach for a lot of these archetypes, and that's where Charizard does its best work. When you're tanking and able to get additional hits in throughout the game, that's where Charizard's going to be laughing. However, it does seem like there are some really awkward matchups in here as well, most notably the Lost Zone variants. It seems like Sableye is the kryptonite of Charizard, where you have so many 60 hit point Pokemon that the Sableye can mop up, and the Giratina can also have one turn at least of getting through your Charizard EX thanks to their V-Star power, which is naturally going to be a little bit tricky for you. It also seems like the Rapid Strike box is also quite difficult. They can simply avoid taking prizes for a number of turns, uh, which keeps your Burning Darkness a uh, low damage output uh, for a lot of the game. And of course, they're packing Cheryl as well, which can be a concern. Of course, Urshifu can't snipe the Charizards themselves, but they can still hit for weakness on the Arceus side of things. And they can also just target Arc on the bench and Pidgeot on the bench with their Urshifu. So they have a number of ways of spreading damage around the board making life difficult for you without activating the burning darkness until they're able to take the last prizes all in one go and that can often include an echoing horn yoga loop combination into another couple prizes the following turn so things get really dicey for charizard onto the deck list for zard uh, there's a couple of interesting takes in here i am choosing the pokemon league headquarters as the secondary stadium two artisan in here giving myself four total outs two bounce path isn't the highest counts 
and I have tried things like Pump Kaboo in here, I've tried Vacuum in here just for the Mysterious Tail dig at times, but it seems like even though Path is a huge issue for the deck, Sableye is the real concern. Sableye is the thing that's making your life uh, a real problem right now in the format, making it less safe for you to put your Charmanders down and whatnot, even after like turn two, etc., because of how quickly the Lost Zone can actually ramp these days. So uh, I'm trying to throw in these League HQs so you can Iono HQ people, and every now and then you have some relief from a Sableye and maybe you can sort of establish your board from then on. Outside of that, I'm trying to increase my counts of all the ball search as high as possible with four Nest, four Ultra, four VIP. And you'll notice it's a two, three line of the Arc V Star because it's just so important to get that star birth on turn two. Uh, I'm still preferring to just have maximum copies of items instead of going for a third copy of Arc itself, because again, we still have Mysterious Tail Mew at our disposal. Uh, so it seems like just playing an item in the slot is just the better choice than going higher on your Arc V count. But there's only so many items that can grab the V star itself, only the four Ultra Balls, and that already competes with Pidgeot and Charizard anyway. So Ultra Ball is one of the most premium cards in the deck regardless. So just adding to the extra V star may look a little bit out of place but I do feel like it makes a lot of sense here. A lot of people are still juggling what goes into Charizard at the moment. I've dropped a Radiant altogether. It feels like Radiant Charizard comes online in the same point in the game where your Charizard EX is already going to be very powerful and hitting the highest damage output available. So Charizard only really seems to chip in against things like Chen Pao that have the means of one hit KOing your Charizard even towards the late game after hitting them with Ionos etc. So it feels like it's not really working in a number of matchups especially when so many decks are flexible with their prize trade and if you go second in a lot of cases your opponent will take out a single prize Pokemon so being a single prize Radiant doesn't really change too much for you. Radiant Alakazam is also something I've experimented with here and there especially against these matchups where you're not able to quite reach on KOs and your opponent is trying to get tricky with the prize trade to keep you out of range. Sometimes you can Alakazam yourself back into a good position and take a multi-prize turn or at least put something into range. And then the second question mark is how are we dealing with Path of the Peak? Right now my list is just playing four bounces but that Lost Vacuum is a little bit more searchable with Mew. I've tried Lunatone Solrock in the deck list uh, even with a fairly high stadium count and that's felt okay. It's really kept your Pidgeot online the entire game and that's the best safeguard you can possibly have but this takes up deck space and board space so it's not really ideal especially when there are matchups where you need to have Manaphy on the board as well. It really becomes difficult for the Lunatone Solrock package to really work out in that case. I've tried also some level balls and pump kaboo. Actually, in that build, I also played a Charmeleon to make the level balls a little bit more versatile. The main issue I have with pump kaboo is its low 60 hit points, means that against the Giratina matchup, it becomes a liability. Even if you are able to use this to bounce the path of the peak and get into the game, it gives your opponent more Sableye fodder, which is a real pain in the neck, which is why I'm not playing pump kaboo anymore. And then the more out there approach is playing some Iridas in place of your Colrus, and then having a thin line of Octillery and choosing to play Tower of Waters rather than any other stadium in the deck because Rapid Strike Search will be a tutorable bounce to Path of the Peak, which then would unlock your Pidgeot. It's a kind of kooky one. You can get even more experimental with Medicham in a similar way I was talking about Alakazam. Uh, that can be a way that you can take uh, essentially multi-prize turns, right? By finishing something off that you are slightly out of range on with your Charizard and then coming in with Charizard again the following turn. And you can even have Echoing Horn in the deck list because it's tutorable with Octillery. So you could do an Octillery tutor for Horn, Pidgeot tutor for Boss, suddenly you have an easy two-prize knockout combination so there are some cool lines still to be found out with Charizard, but it seems like most people are falling in line with just increasing the ball search with the current search options that we have. On to number eight, we have Arceus Giratina. Seems like a bit of a drop off from the World Championships where of course it didn't perform all that well. And it does seem like there are some more awkward matchups in here. I think most notably the rise of the path based Maridon build is a big problem for this archetype because they can deny your star birth for large portions of the game sometimes altogether. And they have a lot of aggression at their disposal disposal. Uh, Gardevoir also seems to be an uh, awkward matchup as well as of course the Urshifu side of the Rapid Strike toolbox is a bit of a concern. For good matchups, still boasting one of the better times into the Lost Zone box variants and also doing pretty okay into the Palkia Chen Pals, that's the Giratina part of your deck putting in the work there, where you are oftentimes able to establish KOs and stay out of range of KOs from the opponent other than a potential big Chen Pao turn, that would be the only time. But of course, you're also playing Path Judge and can disrupt a lot of their flow for large portions of the game. So 
this still seems to be a fairly even deck. It actually seemed that before the World Championships, this deck had a better matchup spread, which indicates to me that the current way that Arc Tina builds have been going with the grass packages is actually making the deck overall weaker in the field. And even adding the grass stuff seems to have only made Charizard an even matchup. And you can even attribute a lot of that win con towards just Path Judge in the first place. A good old trusty combo that Arc Tina's always had. So I'm actually stripping away the grass package and going back to an old faithful Arc Tina in a lot of ways here. You'll notice that I'm playing the double V Guard once again, rather than just having these extra grass attackers and grass energies in the deck list. I feel like V Guard is still going to be one of your best friends against the Lugia matchups and against the Lost Zone Giratina matchups, and even to some extent the Mirror match. The other thing that you'll notice here, a couple things really, uh, two Lost City in the deck list, as well as the three copies of Path of the Peak. This gives us a bounce in the game so we can get a star birth off, even in the Lost Tina matchup and against Miraidon and the Mirror to an extent as well. So this seems like a pretty nice option. There's some argument to try a vacuum in here. So you could go vacuum, then star birth and re-establish path on the same turn. But I still think that's a little bit niche overall. And the upside of City is still a pretty evident card where it can be frustrating for Lost Zone players. It can be frustrating for Gardevoir, which wasn't one of our easier matchups either. So possibly just denying some of their rots and curlies in the opening stages whilst throwing hand disruption at the opponent is also a pretty solid option. And then the other thing you'll notice here is Battle VIP Pass. I was testing a decent amount of arc variants pre-Worlds and I found that VIP Pass was a really solid card actually in the deck list where we're giving ourselves just that better chance of getting double arc developed when we are going second, as well as just making sure we have that Bidoof online, and even just establishing arc plus Spiritomb in the Mew matchup. It felt like VIP Pass was a really high value card, so I'm preferring this over just playing the Quad Nest Quad Ultra, and then possibly like one capturing Aroma or something like that. And three copies seems to be that sweet spot. I feel like if we are going to that fourth count, I'd want to have a vacuum in here, or another way that we can thin it to make our industrious incisors that little bit stronger. But at the end of the day, we still have nest dash into incisors so drawing into these vip pass are a little bit awkward but not so backbreaking at the three count so something i've experimented with pre-worlds and something that i want to lean into again in this new format so we can once again raise those arctina stats back into those 50 50 ranges for other options if you are worried about charizard you can still play some of the grass stuff i've been completely uninspired by them to be honest with you leafion is still my preference for those wondering but it really doesn't seem like charizard is going to be enough of a percentage in the metagame to be worth teching for right now, so it's something I'm not going to choose to do. Vengeful Punch is a, another tech card that could come in to help out against the Gardevoir matchup, but could also help out against Chen Pao, which isn't the easiest either. A lot of your reliance is on good old Judge Path. And Raihan's a card that comes off maybe once every like five games which is why it's currently not in the deck list. But once every five games, this can be the way that you end up going from a losing position into a winning position. So it can be just a means of reaching once again with your Giratina on a certain turn or bouncing back from no energy turn one and finding a backdoor way into attacking the following turn. So it can come in clutch. It just doesn't happen every single game. In at number seven, then we have the world's winning deck Fusion Strike Mew. It seems to have picked up a couple of additional unfavorable matchups, which isn't ideal. The new Charizard EX deck obviously is a dark type but also it comes with a huge heap of hit points which is a huge hurdle for the Mew player to get over. It also is challenged by this new Maridon archetype which can be fast and aggressive, has one hit code potential via Raichu and also is packing par for the peak that can mess you up at certain times if you just don't happen to have the bounce immediately in the hand. Outside of these additional awkward matchups it feels like Mew is still pretty okay and it does feel like there's a good amount of decks cutting Spiritomb so Mew's overall not in the worst position. I still feel like it's an okay deck in the meta, and as we know, it can draw its way out of all sorts of problems. I haven't changed too much with the deck list from the World Championships. It still feels like a pretty solid way to go. I'm just adding in an additional nest ball in the deck list, taking inspiration from Azul's top four list. But there is actually a lot to discuss with Mew. A lot of things that I have considered in the deck list. Echoing Horn is one thing. This could improve your Charizard matchup. Essentially trying to avoid Charizard the entire game, going through Arc, then trying to Horn back Arc V and get another easy prize and also trying to get through the Pidgeot. It would be a roundabout and difficult route because it would require a number of bosses orders and finding the Echoing Horn. But that's one potential way around the matchup. The other thing I've seen a lot online is just going to extra copies of Judge and Path in the deck list, going to two counts of both just to bolster that early game disruption that you have 
which is massive against the Charizard players, and overall not a bad option. Another thing that I've wanted to experiment with but haven't got around to just yet is adding in Town Store to the deck list. It feels like Lost City is getting less valuable now that there are Mirage Step Curliers in a number of these Gardevoir variants, thanks to Tord's second place list at the World Championships. So, going away from Lost City and then adding in Town Stores, having easier access to Box of Disaster and or Vengeful Punch, and having Cleansing Gloves, basically just going with a plethora of tools could be pretty reasonable, especially because you gain spaces by adding Town Store into the deck as a Stadium Bounce compared to Lost City, because you can reduce from the three counts of your Forest Seal Stones and actually continue to increase your outs to hit a Turn 1 Forest, because your Stadium Bounces Turn 1 will now tutor it immediately for you, and then throughout the mid game it's easier access to your damage mods or having these vengeful or box of disaster style cards to improve your matchup into Gardevoir. The other thing that we've seen has also just been more featherball, more trekking shoes, that sort of thing to continue to lean into Mew's consistency. It seems like the wave of Maridon hype is pretty real after the World Championships because its matchup spread is looking very, very promising. The deck essentially just tries to throw hurdles at a number of matchups here and there. Now it has the disruption of Judge and Path of the Peak available to it. It has the disruption of early Photon Blaster pressure against a number of decks, which is why you can see a number of favorable matchups here because you just have so many angles of attack against so many decks in the formats. It's a little bit awkward that Charizard comes out the gates and seems to be one of your less favorable matchups, and you're still struggling into the Lost Zone decks as well as Urshifu, but outside of that, Maridon is looking very promising. The deck list is going to be the same one that I had on the channel from a few days ago, so you can check out more gameplay if you want to. I'm a big fan of the Pokemon Go Zapdos, it would definitely be in my deck list going into the next few events. For other options, there is the Magnezone V-Star if you want to have another potential V-Star power at your disposal and cause a different type of headache against the opponents where you are able to represent spread pressure into their lower hit point Pokemon and force the Manaphy onto their board. The new Maridon EX from Obsidian Flames is an additional free retreating option and with its Techno Turbo is a very solid option at dealing with single prize Pokemon because you essentially get a refund on one of your attachments so that you are working towards that Raichu for potential one hit Kyo plays or just making sure that you have other attackers established even if you only have one Flaffy on the board. Collapse Stadium is an interesting one as we just saw that the Lost Zone matchups are a little bit awkward. We are already playing Switch Cards and Bravery Charms to try and offset some Cram and Sable math but a Collapse Stadium could be another way that you can remove a damaged multi-prize Pokemon from play and essentially undo a turn from the Lost Zone players. In at number 5 we have Lugia Archeops and this deck has really impressed in the last couple weeks in online data. The data is based purely on the single strike build but also the colorless build has been upticking in popularity. And man, its stats are looking really, really insane, to be honest with you. It's boasting a very favorable matchup into both Lost Zone variants, Gardevoir, Mew, Palkia Chempow, and of course, Rapid Strike Box, which was always going to be a very favorable matchup, which only leaves Arctina, Charizard, Chempow, Batscalibur, and the new Maridon keeping this archetype in check. It's a real surprise for me because it seems like Path is on an all-time high as a response to Charizard entering the format, but it doesn't seem to phase Lugia, and with Duraludon out of the picture, this deck gains a couple additional consistency spaces, which seems to be improving its time into the overall field. And the deck list in front of you is doing exactly that, chopping out the Urshifu VMAX and including a Stonejourner and gaining one copy of Impact Energy. A pretty nice card to have in the deck list when we have so many single strike attackers, especially having two single prizes, which are oftentimes going to be going down after one attack. So having the earns and an additional energy in the deck, just make sure that we keep this chain of single strikers rolling. For other options, Cabalion could be a tech inclusion if you are concerned about Charizard. Single Strike Urshifu is still a reasonable option and does still offer some big one hit potential and is pretty nice into the Maridon matchup as well as against Arceus matchup, so it's not completely dead even if Duraludon is far less of a threat going forwards. And I'm currently not playing a Radiant Pokemon, so Serena could make its way back into the deck list if you are still concerned about some potential spread plays that Lost Zone players will make against you. In at number four then, and really impressing as of late, is the Rapid Strike Toolbox. We've known for a while that this archetype is a little bit dodge and weave, so there is a real risk to taking this to any tournaments. I think you have to be quite fortunate with your matchup spread to make it all the way into a top 8 bracket, but I do feel like this deck has a really, really good chance of getting you into a 6-2-1 record, because dodging Mew, Chen Pao Palkia, 
and Lugia a few times in the day should be pretty reasonable. Outside of these dodge and weaves, it seems to have game plans into everything in the format, which is pretty appealing for the deck, and the results are backing it right now. It seems like Cyrus Davis's list is still the best thing to go off of, and I see no reason to make any changes. However, if you do want to add in Squawkabilly, it gives you a turn one push potential play, and right hand could come into the deck list to go alongside your Melanie, so that we have a little bit of extra energy acceleration, but this has the upside of having guaranteed tutor. Could be a decent option, thanks to the Luminion already rooting around the deck list to cherry pick at the right times. Heading into our top three then, and we have Lost Zone Box. It does have a couple very unfavorable matchups. These are sub 40%. The Single Strike Lugia, as well as Arc Giratina. Arctina seems to be on the downturn, so it does seem to be a pretty good time to be playing Lost Zone Box though, because you are boasting a number of decent matchups, you enjoy seeing Charizard out in the field, you enjoy Chen Pao Batscalibur, and you're pretty okay into the other top archetypes like Gardevoir, you don't mind seeing an uptick in Maridon either, so overall looking pretty good for Lost Zone Box, continues to be a real threat in the metagame for me. The only slight tweak I've made to the turbo style of Lost Zone Box is that I've incorporated a couple copies of Town Store. This gives us direct tutor to Forest Seal Stone, and this is a crucial piece to try and work towards our seven wombo combo, going second, turn one, or just establishing those early VIP pass if we've gone first, so that we are getting into the game. Seems to be a really solid card, and thanks to the Town Store inclusion, we're also including a Choice Belt. This makes Dragonite even more dangerous than ever, as it's now able to represent that burst potential of 280 damage, which can be a real swing in a number of matchups. I also wanted to quickly touch on the Kyogre variant. It's not too different from the Turbo build. You essentially add in some energy recyclers and physical energy cards in place of some of your other attacking Pokemon and your lost vacuums. So you are ramping to 7 and 10 a little bit slower in this build, but you are working towards a massive late game of Aquastorm, which can be a comeback in all sorts of matchups. Lost Box has been established for a while, so there isn't too much that we need to talk about in terms of other options. Poker Gear can just add to your Colrus percentages in the opening stages, which is still the bread and butter of the deck. And Pal Pad can be a soft means of protecting yourself against Iono and Judge, making sure that we recover certain supporter cards, and can give you some protection against Pokestop if you are choosing to play it. The other thing I found playing more and more Lost Zone Giratina, actually, is how much I dislike Escape Rope at times. It can feel like a real disadvantage when you are just trying to hit through the active, so possibly incorporating some physical switch in addition to your Escape Rope is something that I've certainly been considering as of late. In a second place, we have Gardevoir EX. It still seems to have a bit of a dicey matchup spread overall. It doesn't enjoy seeing Charizard come out the gates and isn't too happy about Maridon either. It still has the headaches into the Lost Zone matchups, and as of late, it seems to be struggling against the Lugia matchup. It does enjoy Arc Giratina, Mew, and Chen Pao Batscalibur. These aren't the biggest scalps to be having, but as we know, Gardevoir is one of the most decision-heavy decks in the format, and the better the pilot, the better percentages that you get with the deck, so efficient players will be able to squeeze out much higher percentages with this archetype because of its complexity and its flexibility throughout the game. It's brave of me to make any changes from towards second place world's list, but I have done the flip flop of Lost Vacuum back to the Worker Supporter, giving myself a total of four stadium bounces knowing that you can pal pad back Worker at any point in the game is just a nice security blanket for me personally, when I think generally there's going to be higher amounts of path out in the field with Maridon players and with Lost Zone Giratinas likely increasing their counts as of late. It's something that I want to be covering for and making sure that I have my Psychic Embrace online for more turns during the game. Whenever Gardevoir starts cutting the likes of Switch and Penny is when people start adding in more wild and thinking once again about mean look trapping with Umbreon, so it would be remiss of me not to mention these cards currently being absent from the decklist, and if you are concerned about some people getting sneaky and trying to get backdoor wins by gusting up Greninja and trapping it, then be my guest and add back in these cards. The Pokemon League headquarters is a stadium that I thought was going to be very good with Gardevoir, but the more I've tested it against the Lost Zone matchups, the more it's actually hindered my use of Cresselia, because I have to add an extra energy onto it, which then puts it in range of a Cramorant. So it's actually had a little bit of anti-synergy from my expectation, which is why it's not been in the list. But if you found other avenues for the matchup and think that overall just going for an Iono HQ smack with, for example, your Guardi EX is a decent line, it could be a card worth considering. Lost Vacuum was initially in Tord's list and it does give you some coverage against Box of Disaster and the new Vengeful Punch 
tool card. So you can also consider this card coming back into the deck list, especially because in general, just being an item card makes it more tutorable via your Celebrations Mew when you are being thrown down to those lower hand sizes. In at number one then, we have Lost Zone Giratina, and man, its matchup spread continues to impress. It's been on top of the metagame for what feels like a couple months now, and the only matchup which is below even is against Lugia as of late. So it feels like Giratina can face everything in the game. It also feasts on the new Charizard players, so I was really happy to see that in the mix now. Anytime you can face Charizard, you've got to be pretty happy about that. And overall, Giratina just seems to be a well-rounded archetype with answers to pretty much everything. And the online data are continuing to show that Lost Zone Giratina deserves to be in our top spot. The decklist in front of you is quite streamlined and simplistic. It's how I prefer to play Giratina because I feel like a lot of the reason why we have 50-50s rather than more favorable matchups is just the consistency element of the deck in general. So making sure I have maximum counts of our ball search cards, weaving in a poker gear and having really high switch counts are all very important to me. But I do often see a third copy of Path sneaking into the deck list, an additional disruption supporter coming into the list as well, and I'll be the first to admit that Manaphy is a greedy cut. Onto the other options then, Michael Pramrott's top four list of course was playing a third copy of Super Rod in addition to Snorlax. It does open up a number of cool lines and it's also very helpful into the Lost Zone box matchup, so if that's a matchup you respect, the Snorlax can certainly come into the deck list. Manaphy is actually of course a very solid card and like I say it is greedy of me to cut, but it's something I justified for Worlds and ultimately in the mirror match and in the Lost Zone box matchups, just putting down a Manaphy can sometimes feel bad anyway because you're giving your opponent more Sableye targets throughout the game and there have been murmurs of people going to pure grass psychic builds of Giratina and that would make me feel pretty happy that I made the cut. With additional one-offs of Snorlax and Manaphy making it into your list, there's also some justification for suing Heavy Ball here where Greninja's already a really crucial part of the deck and giving yourself any extra percentage to find Confei or even just find Giratina can be massive. There are a few decks just peeping out of the top 10 right now that I do think are worth worth discussing. I'm a massive fan of the Radiant Charizard Lost Box. I've made a video on it very recently. It doesn't have the results to back it up that I can put it in the top 10. It would be quite brazen of me to do so, but I really think it has a place in the metagame right now and has so much strength behind it with a little bit less Lost City in the format. Palkia Chen Pao is a little bit concerned with the wave of Maridon that seems to have hit the ladder and the online tournament space, but outside of that it seems to be a pretty solid archetype and I personally believe it's stronger than Chen Pao Bat's Calibur. However, Baxcalibur has a much higher play rate, which is kind of why it's making its way into the top 10 and not the Palkia variant right now. The colorless build of Lugia has also shown a lot of promise in the last few weeks. Just being a more single prize based build with heavier collapse stadium at your disposal can create a more awkward prize map for a number of these decks and Snorlax is very solid into the Lost Zone matchups and those take up two of our top three spots. So targeting some specific matchups with this build is also really worth considering. The final thing I want to touch on is Arc Umbreon possibly Dura even as well. If we are taking this out of the top 10 and saying we don't have to worry about Dura and don't have to worry about Umbreon, that's when this archetype can make that nasty comeback and start stealing those free wins once again. If we see Lugias with no answers, if we see Gardevoirs with no answers, suddenly Arc Umbreon is stealing wins and getting onto a decent record. Yes, I think it's a little bit worse placed right now with Miraidon coming into the field and more part of the peak base decks and in general Arc probably has to dodge the Lost Zone Giratina. So there's genuine reasons why it's falling out of the top 10 right now, but you always have to be cautious about these cards that can immediately win a game just by putting a Pokemon into play or doing an immediate gust and winning because your deck isn't properly prepared or respecting the archetype anymore. I hope you enjoyed today's top 10 and a slightly different way of presenting the data. Hopefully the traffic lights are a nice representation of the matchup spread. It has been taken from Trainer Hill over the last couple of weeks, so it's based on the online data and there may have been some results that you question so get those questions down below. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you tomorrow for another video. Cheers.